I'm Steven Anderson, and this is, as I see it, because this is my opinion. Yes, I, I want to say thinking biblically, but because that's what I try to do. Old habits die hard. Anyway, uh, just because I say something doesn't mean it's biblically correct. That's my... Uh, why I'm doing this, I haven't done a video in a while. I, I've been too busy watching Europe commit Harry Carey, um, disemboweling themselves. Godless Europe. U, the EU and the UK and everything else over there just... Uh, uh, ow. At least when the Japanese did it, they did it to atone for an act of terrible dishonor. Um, and they were pagans. So, why are the why are the why are the Europeans doing it? Why are the Americans doing it? Disemboweling themselves. America is doing the same thing. We have madmen and women in charge. It's God's judgment. Romans chapter 1. And because did that did not wish to retain even the idea of God, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. See, the, the, Paul's argument there in chapter 1 of Romans is clear that, that they are without excuse because even if they have no scripture, they have creation. And God, uh, contrary to certain views of depravity, God seems to think that is sufficient for them to at least acknowledge him and be thankful to him. He requires it. Seems to, to think that people can do that. Even if that's not a sufficient knowledge to bring you to salvation, it's a it's a sufficient to point you to God, and to His existence, and to His power. Creation doesn't reveal uh, God in His fullness. It just reveals His existence and the fact that He's God, because He created everything. See the idea that that things are created instead of being self-existent. Yeah, but people don't want to think. Have you ever noticed that? Uh, no, it makes my head hurt. It, it leads to trouble. I just want to be left alone in an inebriated state. Yeah, on drugs or alcohol or something. Just so I'm not troubled by things. Well, then you should uh, go to YouTube's uh, uh, trending videos. Because you'll see lots of pictures of kitty cats and doggies, puppy doggies, and things like that, and stupidity. And uh, the whole thing is to be mindless. Well, that's the goal of some religion. Um, Buddhism. <laughs> to be blown out into non-existence. Well, that's what the Europeans are headed. They must be Buddhists. Oh, Steve Jobs became a Buddhist. Where'd that lead him? Well, he's now. You know, he's, uh, you go from bat, uh, out of the frying pan into the fire. Uh, what I'm doing the video about here today, or trying to, is a ver something that really concerns me. <clears throat> because of a church I've been attending uh, for almost a year now, uh, when COVID let up, and they started pulling back on the mandates. You know, for a while, we were, I would, my wife and I, uh, my wife's assisting me. Uh, she doesn't do the preaching. <laughs> we're doing church in a local nursing home for, I don't know, five, six, seven years. And that was what we did on Sunday mornings because that's the only time that it worked. So we weren't involved in other churches I'd go there, we'd preach the gospel, distribute communion to those who 
who desired it and were aware to some degree of what it was. Uh, and that was just preach the New Testament. And that's what we're doing. And it didn't leave time for uh, attending someplace else. And I was having extreme difficulty finding any place that was worth attending. See, I want to go someplace and hear, hear about Christ and Christ crucified and worship God in spirit and truth. <laughs> uh, well, difficult thing to find. But uh, besides, uh, uh, preaching the gospel to others is more important than going and listening to it when you already know it. Worship is something I can do anywhere at any time because it's worshiping of God, not man. I don't need the the associated pomp and ceremony of man, which distracts from that. I can go out and take a walk in the woods and worship God. It's not that I'm worshiping the woods. I'm, I'm, I just find, as Jesus did, I find worship to be easier when you're by yourself. It's not really, Jesus didn't practice communal worship. Notice he go out to pray. Pray is an act of worship. Real prayer. Talking to God is an act of worship. Acknowledging God is an act of worship. Seeing God in creation is an act of worship. That's why one of the things I, I have a sort of a, a hobby of photography. And photography has always been about capturing the beautiful works of God, at least for me. Um, the things you, you see God's beauty in, in the things he's created it's, it's his he's an artist more than a uh, he's not a, he's not a scientist he's an artist Does, he creates science doesn't create science just describes what God has created, except when they don't do that. Like Schrodinger's cat. <sighs> anyway, uh, I have a real concern. I've been attending a neighborhood, pretty much, uh, Nazarene church, a conservative, very small one. I'm not a Nazarene. I'm familiar with them, but I'm not a Nazarene. I, I could care less about their denomination. I have nothing. I, I, I would. I could never join the Nazarenes. And I told the pastor that up front. I talked to him up front. I said, "Okay, you know, I don't accept all these the, 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 these extra biblical things. I don't accept your Nazarene handbook rules, the, the Nazarene rule book. Yeah, I don't accept it. I don't accept denominations. They're unbiblical." He said, oh, we have lots of people here that aren't members. So you, you have to accept those things to be a member. And uh, I said, okay. Sounds okay. If you got a lot of people that aren't members that come here any place, anyway, that's okay. So uh, anyway, I've been going there, and, and I've been growing increasingly uh, uneasy because... Primarily, I have not been hearing the gospel. I have not been hearing about Christ and him crucified. And communion, when, it's, when they get around to practicing it, because they're not too busy doing something else, it is superficial. It is... It is Oh, this COVID thing. Yeah. I mean, when I've never, ever, ever been, you know, the the bread, the so-called bread and, and wine, the grape juice and the, the chiclet cracker in the cup. It's like, really? Come on. I understand COVID. It's gone. It's not a thing anymore. Stop worrying about it. Life, life will kill you sooner or later anyway. I've got a cold right now, by the way. Maybe it's COVID. Who knows? It keeps changing. Yeah. 
The more vaccines you throw at it, the more it'll change. <clears throat> it'll get around them. Did you hear the other day when when uh, Biden, uh, a, as the hurricane was approaching Florida, his, his instruction was, make sure you're vaccinated. Really? Well, that will protect you from the hurricane. Or if you're going to get a vaccine for a hurricane, maybe tetanus would be a good one to get. Not, a, not COVID-19. That, that old... What can you say? God's judgment. The American people chose their own judgment. Remember when, when God gave David a choice of the judgment he's going to get, get on him? Because of David's sin. The whole country. Now, David, I don't think he picked wisely because he picked, you know, if he was a truly righteous king, he would have said, well, just judge me. Leave, you know, don't judge the people. If he was Christ-like, David wasn't always that way, was he? When he numbered the people, you know, pride, arrogance. How much power do I have? Uh, <clears throat> anyway, this uh, I've, I've been becoming increasing, increasingly uneasy uh, with their. I mean, because I'm very biblical minded, and I, I suppose when you're a preacher, you tend to critique everybody else's preaching and say, well, you, you think. I, I think when I hear people preach, I say, well, you should have brought this up or you should have brought that up, which is, I've been thinking I should, re if, if I preach, I should record them so I can critique myself. Because I usually can't remember what I said. I don't do a written sermon. I use God's word and say, this is what I'm going to go through. Now, uh, the 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 silly choruses and things like that. Just this isn't worship. I can't worship this crap. Goes for hymns too. I find I'll look in the hymn book. I'll look at the words. And say, I'm not going to sing that. I don't think that's biblically correct. It's, it's it's so much, and it's not simply a Nazarene issue. So much of what's called Christianity today is man-centered, flesh-centered. What pleases us? You know, like the bell choirs, man. Talk about something that's just it's utterly annoying. You think that pleases God? People add. You know, one of the, the things that, that people should learn from Calvinism is a regulative principle of worship. <coughs> you worship according to how God instructs you to worship, not according to how what pleases you. Uh, there's some problems with Calvinism, uh, <laughs> some big problems, <clears throat> but that's not one of them. They're not the only ones that have that, by the way. Churches of Christ historically have been very high on the regulative principle of worship, although they didn't call it that. But in their case, it's simple legalism, <coughs> and it's it is uh, hypocritic <coughs> hypocritical legalism. <laughs> You can't have a piano, but you can have an air conditioner. <laughs> well, really, a piano is there to 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 help regulate the worship anyway. To to uh, they had precaution in the Old Testament. They don't, they don't care. I mean, Church of the Church of Christ, traditional churches of Christ, are not Christian churches, in spite of the fact that they often call themselves Christian churches. They're not. It's legalism. It's nothing but um, Pelagianism. It's what you do to get saved. It's not what God does. The idea of God being active in salvation is, no. It was, uh, now, this is odd because the Campbells, the people that started it, uh, Alexander Campbell and his father Thomas, if I remember the name right, were came from an ultra-strict Calvinistic 
Scottish sect, I think. That and they were they that repelled them the 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 utter sectarianism and the refusal to allow others to take part of communion. Oh yeah, that's something that goes on all the time. <clears throat> um, closed communion you know, it's abomination in the sight of God. Now I don't mean closed communion is as if you're not a believer in Christ, this is not something you should be doing. Yeah, that's that's it, it's for God's people. But anybody that has any kind of a reasonable profession of faith that's not living a lifestyle that is manifestly ungodly, manifest a manifest sinners, you know, the kind of sinners that you must put out of the church because it's evident, evident they're not saved. You can't turn those people away. If somebody comes and visits your church and says, well, I'm a Christian, I believe in Christ, I believe he died for my sins. You know, any kind of a reasonable, orthodox, biblical Christianity. To, to say that you can't partake of the Lord's Supper is an act of, it's a violation of the Lord's Supper itself. It is excluding them from the body of Christ. And it is, the, the, the Lord's Supper is all about the body of Christ. It's about Christ. He is our common possession. Our koinonia, he is our fellowship. And if you say you can't partake of the bread and the wine that says, do this in remembrance of my of my death, you're saying they're not a Christian at all. Which actually you're saying you're not a Christian at all. You're an utter sectarian and a Pharisee. I'm thinking of a Lutheran denomination that practices close communion. I don't know what the heck their standards are. You have to, you have to, I think you have to swallow the book of Concord whole. I don't know. The book of Concord, that's the book of agreement. It's big. I got it out here. Oh, I probably got it in the house. It, it's, well, it's this big. No, that is not what defines a Christian. If you say, unless you agree with our sect... And that's what it is. You set yourself apart. Denominationalism is, is sinful in the eyes of God. It comes about in part because of error and heresy. And you have to separate from that. But when you say, we've got this book here that's not the Bible. And you have to agree with that book. Nazarenes, same way. Methodists, they have their book of discipline. That's where the Nazarenes got theirs. Because they're basically Methodists. Anyway, back to the Nazarenes. Okay, so the other day I had a few minutes that I would have to spend sitting down someplace. And I grabbed this. I had bought this Wesleyan Holiness Theology by uh, J. Uh, Kenneth Grider because it was the only book on theology I could find. The Holiness Movement, uh, well, Wesley, I don't know how you could do a theology on Wesley. There was a man that is was unstable, and I have serious doubts whether he ever understood the gospel. Uh, he was, in fact, I think, and I was beginning to, one of the concerns I was beginning to have about the Nazarenes is the whole movement was a a restoration movement a, to to go back to Wesley's uh, the Methodists they were Methodists and they had becoming there was a movement among the Methodists to return to Wesley's doctrine of entire sanctification because it was sort of being discarded for good reason because it's not biblical ooh I got a cold and I just suddenly got uh, Anyway, uh, uh, 
I was thinking that the, the uh, one of the reasons I've been coming un uncomfortable is I don't hear Christ and Him crucified being preached. I was thinking, well, the, the, the movement really wasn't about Christ and Him crucified. It was not about, you know, biblical Christianity. Paul is very clear. In Romans, Paul's theme is we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. Uh, we have a righteousness that's given to us through faith. It's not our own righteousness. And I be was beginning to get the sense that this whole movement wasn't about that. It was about self-righteousness, us being holy. And if you think your holiness is the basis of your relationship with God, well, you're toast. Because you're not trusting in Christ. I was beginning concerned because I wasn't hearing Christ and Christ crucified. And that is the center of Christianity. The non-negotiable is the cross. And if you're not hearing Christ and Christ crucified, Paul said, uh, writing to the Corinthians, I determined when he said, I determined when I came to you that I was going to preach nothing among you except Christ and Christ crucified. You don't have that, you've got nothing. That has to be front and center, always, because that's the foundation of everything. What Christ did on the cross, and <clears throat> I just wasn't hearing that. And then yes, I think it was yesterday. I was headed toward the bathroom. You know, you're going to spend a few minutes in there. So as, this is how weird I am. I grabbed this book, which I hadn't read in depth. I, I bought it to, to find it. Okay, where do, what is the theological justification for entire sanctification? Okay, there's two verses in the Bible that don't say what they say it says. Totally bogus. That's why I got, I want an authoritative source. That's what most of these books on the shelf are, over here are. You can't see they're my reference library because I want, you know, it's like Roman Catholicism. I want to know what the Roman Catholics actually teach before I condemn them for what they teach or critique them or whatever. I, I want to, not just somebody's opinion, not just rumor, not just something from a jack chick track. I want to know what they actually teach. It might involve acting, asking a Catholic priest or, or attending and seeing, you know. It's like Catholicism. My, my wife's family were Catholics. And before I married my wife, I made sure I understood that and what it actually taught. But I wasn't going to become a Catholic. Anyway, the uh, in this, so I grabbed this book. Like I said, I'd only bought it to look up one thing. And I opened it to page 115, just randomly. And it says, The Righteousness of God. Oh, I suppose, you know, redeeming the time. So I started to read this, and I was like, What in the, you know what, is this? So this guy, now Grider, again, this is the only book on Wesley, you know, Nazarene theology I could find, Wesleyan holiness. Grider, this book is used in their seminaries. He taught in their seminaries for years and years and years. What, uh, Wesley, or Nazarene. So, you know, again, this I thought was a pretty authoritative source, I would think, since he was never crucified as a heretic or burned at the stake or anything. Perhaps he should have been. So the righteousness of God, oh, that's something that you know, that I want to hear about. Grider denies, I started reading page 115, and it denies, Grider denies that righteousness is an attribute of God, part of God's nature. <coughs> Because the chapter is on uh, God's existence in nature. In other words, theology proper. God himself. 
And then the next thing, it says righteousness of God. Then I, I turn the page and it's the love of God. And in both cases, Grider denies that, that, that righteousness and love are attributes of God's nature. This man is an absolute heretic. According to Grider, there are only things that God does. God's works, we describe God's works as righteous because God does them. And God's love as uh, whatever, love, because God does it. God chooses to freely love. It's not part of his nature. Uh, apparently, according to Grider, uh, or the impression I get from what Grider writes here, he doesn't explicitly say this, is that if God didn't freely choose to be righteous, it wouldn't be a virtue. It wouldn't be credit to him. In other words, works righteousness. See, this man is so far removed from the gospel. Again, this goes back to a the, the righteousness of the Pharisees. As Let me bring that up. Um, bring up Bible works here. Uh, Romans chapter 10, beginning of Romans chapter 10. And... <clears throat> Oh, hit the wrong button. I'm going to bring up a second copy of it. No, I don't need that. Okay. <clears throat> brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them, for the Jews, for his brethren, according to the flesh, is for their salvation. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, <clears throat> but not according to knowledge. So they need to be saved. Zeal for God is not sufficient to save you. For not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes that a man who practices the, the righteousness, which is based on law, on rules, shall live by that righteousness. But the righteousness of faith, based on faith, speaks thus, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. That is the word of faith we're preaching, that if you confess that Jesus, with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Paul's theme in all his writings is salvation by grace through faith in Christ, not of works. Works are excluded. They must be excluded. <sighs> but the Nazarenes, I think, my experience with them is they tend to as most of humanity, to think of their relationship with God as dependent on their works, on their obedience, on their following the rules. On, uh, you know, they, are, they have a sin consciousness, but not a faith consciousness, not a salvation consciousness. Christ paid for our sins, but they don't believe that. This guy doesn't believe it. But the, the, and here, the very idea, oh, I'm sorry, nausea, um, that God is only righteous because he's, he chooses to do righteous works. So they got God's righteousness being a righteousness of works and God's love being a, a love of works based on his deeds. Oh. Is it my cold or is it the content of the book here? But uh, so then this, you know, the idea that God's uh, 
that righteousness is not an attribute of God's nature? And because if it was, then it wouldn't really be to God's credit? Eh! Uh, That reflects this whole works mentality, reading it back into God himself. And the idea that God's love is simply freely chosen acts, otherwise it would have have no merit. Well, let me point out, God doesn't need merit. Talk about reading your own theology into God. It's a, it's a heresy. Grider is a Kenneth J. Kenneth Grider is a absolute heretic. And this is the, as far as I know, the standard textbook for uh, Wesleyan holiness theology. So you've got the Nazarenes and a bunch of other, the Wesleyans and a bunch of other denominations in that galaxy of whatever it is. I'm not going to say Christianity at this moment. So I saw this sitting on the throne. (laughs) I don't want to go any farther with that. Uh, (laughs) uh, And I was flabbergasted. I mean, I just I just had randomly opened it to page one fifteen, and I saw this and I'm like, "What is this?" I said, I, "I have to look through this a little bit more." I just bought it for reference. So, if you want to find out whether something is Christian or not, first of all, you go to the most important doctrine: Christ and Him crucified. Go to the atonement. What do they say about the atonement? And again, this is, I'm going to have to ask the pastor over there. I think I, think I might go back there Sunday and say, is, does this represent, properly represents Nazarene doctrine, since it's taught in our seminaries, since this guy was a Nazarene professor for years and years and years. So I want to know. And then I'm going to have to ask him, what is your view of the atonement? Do you agree with Greider in the governmental view of the atonement? Grotius's view. Because if he does, we have no fellowship. I can have no fellowship with somebody that does not accept the penal substitutionary atonement view. That Christ died, he took our punishment upon himself and died in our place. Maybe that's why I don't hear the gospel there, because they don't believe it. Now, I'm not going to indict all Nazarenes of this because their Nazarene handbook does not say specifically on some of these things. It doesn't have, a, say, you must agree with the government or the view of Grotius on the atonement or, or it must uh, hold to the, uh, uh, some of the other things. It's more like uh, no drinking, no playing cards, no dancing, no gambling. To be a member, okay, that's, that's that was never on the table for me. It's like no, because the Bible doesn't teach that. It doesn't say drinking alcohol is a sin. Drunkenness, especially habitual drunkenness, an alcoholic, is a sin. Uh, a person that is that is defined as the Bible as someone that's not really saved. So I, I turned over to Grider's, find out Grider's view. And 
he very definitely rejects the historic Protestant view. And I would say Roman Catholic view. I believe that this is also, I could go, well, I know there's a conservative Catholic, uh, priest, but I know sort of a little bit, talked to him a couple times. And if I went to him and, and said, do you believe in what's often called the, the penal substitutionary view that Christ took our punishment upon himself on the cross? And I'm pretty sure that they'd say yes, because this is a historical Christian doctrine. The, the Reformers didn't invent that. I mean, Calvin and, and Luther, these people were steeped in Roman Catholic uh, Catholicism. They were, Ro they were Roman Catholic priests, ordained. And uh, uh, Luther was a professor of theology at Wittenberg. Catholic. So, they didn't invent that stuff. It's historic Christian doctrine. So I would have, but Grotius came up with this idea that, no, it was just a, a token payment that God could appear to be just and yet justify sinners. Not that Christ actually paid our bill, paid our debt, paid the penalty of the law. The wages of sin is death. The soul that sins shall die. That he took our sin upon himself and died. Grider appears to deny that completely. Denies the idea that, that, that Christ could do that, that he could die in our place. You can't get farther removed from the gospel than that. Better to be an outright pagan just denying that God exists than to teach what I <clears throat> what appears to me Grider teaches. He is dead now. In the abode of the dead, I would imagine. Not seated in heavenly places in Christ. Because to deny what Christ did on the cross, that Christianity has always held, is to reject the gospel. It is to reject Christ and substitute your own works. Romans 1 again, or Romans 10. Not knowing about God's righteousness, which is often called imputed righteousness or alien righteousness, a, a righteousness that is not our own, that's given to us as a gift of God to make us acceptable to God. Through faith and seeking to establish their own. That's the holiness movement. That's Wesley. Establish your own righteousness. That to, and if you want to go to the real extreme, Finney, Charles Finney, the lauded evangelist of the so-called Second Great Awakening, or the Second Darkening of America, more likely, that we must stand in our own righteousness before God based on our own works, not on Christ's works. Well, then you're in hell. Because you will not stand before the judgment seat of God dressed in your own robes. They're filthy. Pollute it with sin, your sin. God requires perfection, sinlessness. You don't have that. Wesley thought you could get it. You could do it. You could be sinlessly perfect with his imaginary second work of grace. And that's what it is, imaginary. 
People that think they're sinlessly perfect have deceived themselves, as John says in 1 John. If anyone says he has no sin, he has deceived himself, and the truth is not in him. So people that think they're sinlessly perfect are, are nothing but self-deceived. Now, I hadn't heard a lot about that there because the Nazarenes basically, well, the movement's dying because their doctrine's dead. It's not truth. I don't think anybody sin, preaches sinless perfection anymore. That's, Nazarenes have pretty much rejected it. But I don't know what they preach. They don't preach a cross. They don't preach imputed righteousness. <coughs> Even though Wesley acknowledged a need for it. Wesley was not a follower of Grotius. Wesley believed in the penal substitutionary atonement of Christ. See, these people don't even follow Wesley. Apparently. Of course, the Methodist Church doesn't follow Wesley either, have you noticed? Uh, yeah. No, I think the United, the United Methodist Church is, is sort of like, let us sin that grace may abound. The exact opposite. Uh, anyway... The, the, so that is that is a touchstone. If you're examining a church or denomination, check out their the theology of the cross. Do they believe in penal substitutionary atonement? And if they if they say no, God does not engage in uh, cosmic child abuse or something like that, know for a fact they are not truly Christian. Because the gospel is about Christ taking our sins upon himself. All the animal sacrifices was, were done in, as teaching in preparation for that. All the Old Testament commandments about sacrificing a, a spotless lamb, for example, pointed to Christ, to the need for your, something else to bear your sins that you might be acceptable to God. I don't hear that. And I guess there's going to have to be a little confrontation and say, what do you believe? Do you stand with, with uh, Grider and Grotius? Or you just stand with the Apostle Paul and Jesus Christ. I want to know. I want to know why you're not preaching Christ and Him crucified in any kind of a. I, I don't remember hearing it. You know, when you've been going someplace for about a year and you haven't heard that. Now, that's not uncommon in churches in America. Fundamentalist Baptist churches. They do not preach Christ and Him crucified, from my experience with them. Not consistently. And the gospel tends to be something that's added on at the end of the sermon. It's not the content of the sermon, which usually comes from the Old Testament. There are some churches out there that still consistently focus on Christ and Him crucified. If you find one, you found a rare jewel. Because America is deep in apostasy. That is why God's judgment's on this country. That's why Joe Biden is president. It's God's judgment. Yeah, so God even managed to get Kamala in as vice president so he can't get rid of Joe. You can't just vote God's judgment off. America chose their own poison, their own judgment. 
America will choose it again and again until America repents or is destroyed. What is that hymn? You know, God shed his grace on the... Yeah, but America rejected God's grace. And now it gets God's judgment. That's where we are. American Christianity. When you decide to, uh, to forget about God's righteousness and create a righteousness for yourself to stand in, like Finney, Charles Finney, is, is most clearly. But he's revered. He was revered by Billy Graham and others. Finney, who said you must stand in your own righteousness before God. Well, that is not the gospel at all. That is a gospel of works that cannot save you. The atonement, according to Grotius, according to Grider, can't save you. Because you don't have a sacrifice. You don't have a spotless lamb that takes your sin and dies for your sin in your place. That's penal substitutionary atonement. They reject it. That's irrational. not accepting the gift of God's righteousness that Christ shed his blood on the cross for, that you might be made acceptable to God and seeking to make themselves acceptable to God. Well, Roman Catholics are more orthodox than that. I did tell the preacher over there, maybe it was like the last time I went there. I haven't been there for a while. Uh, every time I don't go, I get a phone call from one of the church members. What's the problem? Well, like last week, I've got a cold. Uh, <clears throat> and the week before that, my wife had the cold. <laughs> but... If you don't have Christ and him crucified for your sins, what do you have? You don't have the gospel. You have no salvation. So you end up preaching moralisms. That will not help you at the judgment seat of Christ. If your confession is not, you died for my sins, you nailed my sins to your cross, therefore my debt is paid in full by your blood, you're not saved. You don't believe that, you're not saved. And that's what's called penal substitutionary atonement. Christ died in our place. We were under the condemnation of the law, and Christ died. We participate in his death through faith in Christ and what he did, and faith alone. If you want to add works to that because you don't think Christ's death was sufficient, then you're damned. You don't have his salvation. Paul makes it very clear in Galatians. If you add one commandment, in that case it was circumcision, which would be an easy commandment to justify, since it goes back to Abraham, Paul said, you've cut yourself off from Christ. Very graphic, considering circumcision. You've cut yourself off. It's like Europe's cut themselves off from gas.
Done it to yourself. Condemned yourself. I'm not saying all Nazarenes are not Christians. What I'm saying is, this book of theology is a book of heresy. And it is taught in our seminaries. And I'm warning Nazarenes, unless your faith is in Christ and in his cross, what he did for you, he died in your place. And your sole hope and faith is in him and what he did. You will not stand before God, but you will be cast into the abyss. And I think that's sufficient to say.